I'm Bart Ehrman. I'm, uh, I identify as both a humanist and an agnostic. And uh, are, you, uh, are you openly agnostic? Uh, what do you mean openly? Do people know it? Or do your family know Am it? Am I in the closet? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm quite openly agnostic. Everybody knows it. So yes, writing books about it means you're open. Huh? Uh, well, if anybody reads my books, they know I, I'm an agnostic, yeah. <laughs> now, and I find it interesting, um, having read uh, most of your books, uh, how you talk about that you weren't always uh, agnostic. No, I started out as an uh, evangelical Christian. Uh, I got interested in biblical studies because I was, a, I was actually a fundamentalist and uh, as a late teenager. And that's what got me interested in the Bible. But as I developed my scholarship through graduate school, I realized that my beliefs about the Bible were completely wrong, that um, the Bible is not some kind of inerrant revelation from God. Uh, and so for years, I, turned, I had become a, a liberal Christian. Um, I still went to church. I still believed in God. But I, was, uh, I didn't believe that the Bible was the inspired word of God. Um, but after many years of being a liberal Christian, I finally became an agnostic. Uh, for reasons unrelated to my scholarship, uh, reason having to do with why there's suffering in the world if there's a God who's in control. Uh, and I, 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 for years I had thought about it. I read what biblical authors said, I read what theologians said, I read what philosophers said, and I got to a point where I just didn't believe it anymore. And so I, uh, I just acknowledged at one point then that I'm probably an agnostic and that's what I've been for maybe 15 or 16 years. It sounds like it was a very um, gradual uh, process. It was, uh, you know, when some I've, I've heard people say that I went from being that I <laughs> went from being a fundamentalist to being an agnostic uh, because of problems in the Bible, and it's completely wrong. It was a very long process. I was a very open-minded uh, liberal Christian for many, many years, uh, and it was really this problem of suffering that ended up uh, creating the the big issue for me that led me to be to acknowledge that I'm I'm an agnostic. It's very interesting being an agnostic scholar of religion. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to explore what it means for me to be one. I think I'll begin by explaining what I mean by uh, what I myself mean by this term that I'm using that we all use all the time, the term agnostic. Because over the last 18 months or so, I've come to think it means something different from what I used to think. So what I used to think before I was an agnostic was that agnostics and atheists were two degrees of the same thing. Uh, and when I first declared myself agnostic, I was amazed at how militant both agnostics and atheists can be about their terms. <laughs> Every agnostic I met thought that atheists were simply arrogant agnostics. And every atheist thought that every agnostic was simply a wimpy atheist. <laughs> Two degrees of the same thing. Well, someone will just say, I don't know. The other will admit they do know. And so that was the, I have come to think that, in fact, they are not two degrees of the same thing. They're two different kinds of thing. That agnosticism has to do with epistemology. What you know. What you know. And atheism has to do with belief, what you believe. I actually consider myself to be both an agnostic and an atheist. I'm an agnostic because if somebody says to me, is there a greater power in the universe? My response is, how the hell would I know? <laughs> I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. If somebody were to ask me, do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you believe in a God who interacts with the world, who intervenes in the world, who answers prayer? Do you believe in a supernatural divine being? No, I don't believe it. So I don't believe it, so I'm an atheist. But I don't know, so I'm an agnostic. Um, and since I'm a scholar, I prefer to emphasize knowledge rather than belief. And so I tend to identify as an agnostic. Has your uh, family, uh, was there any issues with coming out to them? Were they very religious? Did that bother them that you had given up your belief? Uh, when I was an evangelical Christian, uh, 
uh, most of my family converted to evangelical Christianity in my wake. And so, uh, so uh, when, I, when I left the Christian fold, uh, they did not leave with me. And so that they're still there wondering where I went. So you're an evangelical agnostic, I guess. Uh, yes, that's right. I, uh, I mean, the thing is, I don't, I don't really believe... You know, when, when, when I was an evangelical Christian, I believed in converting everybody to my point of view because I thought if you didn't agree with me, you were going to roast in hell. And so I was very evangelistic. I'm not, I'm not evangelistic as an agnostic because I ultimately don't think that, I mean, it certainly doesn't matter for somebody's afterlife because there, I don't believe there is an, an, after, is an afterlife. And so, uh, and I'm not that interested in people converting to what I think. What I'm interested in is getting people to be more thoughtful about whatever they believe or don't believe. Uh, and so I'm not interested in converting anybody, actually. You talk about in your books how many um, people who become ministers and learn these same facts of the Bible uh, seem reluctant to share that with their con congregations. Why do you think that is? Well, pastors learn the kind of material I teach in seminaries or divinity schools if they go to a mainline denominational school. If they go to a fundamentalist seminary, of course they don't learn this unless they learn it in order to attack it. Uh, or an evangelical school wouldn't teach this kind of material. But, but Lutheran, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian seminaries teach this, this kind of material. Uh, and yet, when the people who go through those, that training become pastors, they tend not to tell their congregations. And I think it's because uh, they're afraid to make waves. Uh, they don't think that people will be uh, welcoming of it. They don't think people are ready for it. Uh, there's some issues of job security. <laughs> they, they, they want to keep their job, and so uh, they don't want to ruffle too many feathers. But I think it's too bad because churches have education programs, and it's a pity that people aren't getting educated. Uh, there are adult education programs in most churches, but adults, they don't actually get educated. They, they sit around and talk about other issues, but they don't talk about the things that really most people are interested in, which is what, what does one think about the Bible? What, what does one think about theology? And do you think, though, that they may feel that uh, this may uh, put too many doubts in people's minds? Uh... Well, yeah, possibly. I think, you know, pe pastors tend not to be in the business of generating doubt. Uh, professors at universities that, that is our business as professors because our goal is to get people to think, but, but pastors generally don't see that as their, as their goal, and so they tend to shy away from these various issues that would cause problems for people. But the result is it means that they've got parishioners who really don't know anything about what scholars are saying about the material that they're most interested in, which I think is a real pity. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman. There's a famous bumper sticker which I came across many years ago which said in large print, read the Bible every day. And then in small print when you got close it said it will scare the hell out of you. <laughs> Bart Ehrman brings a much needed sanity to the discussion about religion, not least about the Bible. Religious literacy in this country is very, very low. We are very religious and appallingly ignorant. And people who claim to know the Bible don't know the Bible. And I learned from Stephen Prothero that 10% of Americans believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> the most popular text in the Bible isn't in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. That was Ben Franklin. So we have a lot to think about. The political philosopher Michael Oakeshott reminds us that a culture is made up of many voices and all the voices without exception are called to join in a conversation, an endless unrehearsed intellectual adventure in which in imagination we enter into a variety of modes of understanding the world and ourselves and are not disconcerted by the differences or dismayed by the inconclusiveness of it all. But it takes a certain amount of maturity to be able to take differences in our stride and not to be driven crazy by inconclusiveness. The narrative in which we choose to live our lives is of the utmost importance and it takes conviction and courage to keep the conversation respectful with regard to the fragility and mystery of others. To know that our stories aren't the only ones <laughs> 
Many people in our world and in our culture find this unbearable since in their minds only one story can be the true one. Dr. Ehrman, for example, is very clear about the roots of Christian anti-Semitism, which is riddled throughout history. His is an important and I think sane voice in this cultural conversation, in a culture rife with raucous certainties. He is a professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a biblical scholar, and a leading authority on the life of Jesus. He's written several books on, the, on a common theme, God's Problem, about suffering, misquoting Jesus. Jesus Interrupted, where the Boston Globe said, for more than a few folks, Jesus Interrupted will be a grenade tossed into their tidy living rooms of religious faith. And now, forged, writing in the name of God, why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are. My own debt to Dr. Ehrman is immense in that while he has confined himself to the historical critical method in illuminating the text, he has exposed the absurdities of biblical fundamentalism and literalism. He takes the rhetoric of a living text seriously in its ambiguity, and it's that ambiguity that drives those of a certain mind crazy. And it's my privilege and pleasure then to welcome Dr. Bart Ehrman. Well, thank, thank you very much, Alan, for that uh, introduction, and thank you for, uh, for coming. Uh, this issue of uh, a greater commitment to the Bible, the knowledge about it, is something that I deal with all the time. I teach uh, biblical studies, the New Testament, in uh, North Carolina, uh, in the Bible Belt. And uh, every semester I have uh, a large number of students who are absolutely convinced that the Bible is the Word of God and don't know the first thing about it. Uh, so uh, I actually have this exercise that I do the first day of class when I teach my New Testament introduction. Uh, this is a class that normally has between three and 350 students uh, in it, so it's a large auditorium. And uh, after I hand out the syllabus, I, I explain to the students that this is not a, it's not a Sunday school class. Uh, this is not church. Uh, I won't be approaching the Bible from a devotional or a confessional point of view. This will be a historical study of the New Testament. Uh, so it's somewhat, somewhat different from what they're accustomed to because most of my students have grown up in church and uh, they're taking the class, frankly, because they have to fulfill a philosophy perspective in the curriculum and they've had to decide, do they want to study Immanuel Kant or the parables of Jesus? <laughs> and uh, thinking that it'd be much easier to study the parables of Jesus, I have 350 students. Uh, and so uh, I start the class after I hand out the syllabus and explain the nature of the course. I give them, uh, to their surprise, a pop quiz. Uh, and so uh, they, they th think it's a little odd to be given a quiz before I've actually taught them anything. But I want to see, what do they know about the Bible? And I want them to see that, in fact, they probably don't know very much about the Bible. Uh, there are 11 questions on this quiz. And I tell them that if anyone in here gets eight of these right, I'll buy you dinner at the Armadillo Grill. Last year, I didn't buy a single dinner. And these are not hard questions. Uh, just to give you uh, an example, I, I start off, th the first question is, how many books are in the New Testament? Well, uh, you know, if you've been studying the Bible all your life as these kids, you would think they would have some idea. They have no idea. It's actually an easy answer, by the way. The answer is 27. Uh, the reason that's an easy answer is because when you think of the New Testament, you think of God, and you think of the Christian God. When you think of the Christian God, you think of the Trinity. And what is, what is the 27? It's three to the third power. Three times three times three. It's a miracle. <laughs> so the next question is, in what language were these books written? So as it turns out, interestingly, about half of my students think that the answer is Hebrew. I've never quite figured out why that is. I think it's because when you watch the TV shows about Jesus on the Discovery Channel or, or History Channel, they always flash up these Hebrew manuscripts in the background, and so people associate Hebrew with Jesus. So that's what they think. So about, about half think Hebrew. Usually only four or five think that the answer is English. Uh, uh, but, but the, the, answer is, the answer is Greek. So, uh, well, so I, have, I have a bunch of these kinds of questions. I, I do throw in a couple of curveballs <laughs> because I don't want to buy any dinners. And so uh, one of my curveballs is, uh, what was the Apostle Paul's last name? 
and uh, I'll I always have some students say, of Tarsus, <laughs> uh, which is not right. But I teach them this. I, I use this quiz as a way of teaching them some things. And one of the things I want them to understand is that people in the ancient world didn't have last names uh, unless they were part of the upper crust aristocracy. Uh, and so in the New Testament, you have a lot of people with the same name. That's why they're identified. You have all these Marys. Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary of Bethany, Mary Magdalene. And so you have to identify a Mary because Marys didn't have last names. And the reason I have to teach my students this is because they assume that Jesus Christ, you know, Christ is the last name. Like Jesus Christ born to Joseph and Mary Christ. And I have to tell them, no, that's not it. So, so my students know very little about just factual information about the Bible, let alone what scholars are saying. Uh, about the Bible, what scholarship is saying uh, in, the, in the historical analysis of, of the New Testament. One of the things that scholars have said for a long time about the New Testament is that some of the books in the New Testament are not written by the people who are claimed as their authors. Many of the books are not written by the people who are claimed as their authors. And so that's what I want to talk uh, with you about uh, in my few minutes uh, with you. And I'm going to start actually by uh, moving outside of the New Testament and moving back into it. I want to talk about a couple of texts that did not make it into the New Testament that are very interesting uh, in, in part precisely because they claim to be written by people who did not write them. The first account I want to talk about is a gospel called the Gospel of Peter, which actually claims to be written by Jesus' right-hand man and and head disciple, the Apostle Peter. Even though it wasn't written by Peter, but it certainly claims to be written by Peter. It's a very interesting document. Uh, we had known about it for centuries, but it wasn't discovered until 1886. There was a French archaeological team working out of Cairo, Egypt, that was digging in a part of Egypt a couple hundred miles south of Cairo, an area called Akmim. And uh, they were digging up a cemetery. This was a French archaeological team that was digging up a cemetery and they uncovered the tomb of what they assumed was a monk because this person was buried with a sacred book. The book was a 66-page book uh, that had several texts in it. So it was a small anthology of texts. The first text in the book was, that took up the first 10 pages was this thing I'm calling the Gospel of Peter. It starts actually in the middle of a sentence. Uh, the, the way the book is constructed is the first page is blank, the next page has a cross drawn on it, the third page begins at the top of the page, but it begins in the middle of a sentence, which means that the person who made this book, who copied this book, probably in the 7th century or the 6th century, was copying something that was already a fragment. You see what I'm saying? The book itself is not a fragment, but he was copying a fragment. And it starts off by saying, none of the Jews wanted to wash his hands, and so Pilate stood up. Well, uh, if you know the New Testament well enough, that, that, uh, that calls to mind a story that's found only in the Gospel of Matthew, where Pilate washes his hands and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood, and the crowd cries out, his blood be upon us and our children. This verse that has been used for so many anti-Semitic purposes over the, over the centuries. Well, the Gospel of Peter adds something that's not found in Matthew. It says none of the Jews wanted to wash his hands. So, so this is actually going to blame Jews more for Jesus' death, even than Jews are blamed in the New Testament. What happens then is the account goes through the trial and the, uh, the condemnation, the execution, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, this is a passion narrative that in many ways is like the passion narratives of the New Testament, but is also very different in some ways. The greatest differences come at the very end. My students are surprised when I tell them that in the New Testament Gospels, there is no narration of the resurrection of Jesus. But in fact, it's true. Jesus' resurrection is not narrated in the New Testament. What happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that Jesus dies, he's buried, and then three days later the women go to the tomb and they find that the tomb is empty. So the resurrection has happened before they come to the tomb. There's no account of the actual resurrection, Jesus coming out of the tomb. There is an account like that in the Gospel of Peter, though, and it's a very intriguing account. According to the Gospel of Peter, the Romans set a guard at the tomb. And while the guard was watching the tomb to make sure that nobody would come to steal the body, two angelic figures descend from heaven. 
And as they descend, the stone in front of the tomb rolls away. The two angelic beings come down and they enter into the cave. And then they come out supporting a third person. These angels are so tall that their head reaches up to the sky. The one they're supporting, his head reaches up above the sky. And after they come out from the tomb, behind them there emerges the cross. And a voice comes from heaven and asks, Have you preached to those who are asleep? And the cross replies, yes. Well, this is an amazing story. A giant Jesus and a walking, talking cross. <laughs> How this thing didn't survive for all the centuries is beyond me. <laughs> this seems like one you'd want to keep. So the, the whole thing, of course, is, is, uh, is, is metaphorical. The, the, these angels are taller than humans. They're giants because they're divine beings. Divine beings are super, superhuman, so they're taller. Jesus is taller than them because he's the son of God, so he's really tall. And the cross, the walking, talking cross, is a metaphor. Uh, has the message of the salvation brought by the cross of Jesus gone to those who are asleep, meaning gone to those who have died? Yes, uh, Christ's salvation extends even to those who died before he appeared on earth. And so it's a theological message being preached. Well, one of the most interesting features of this, this text is that at the end, it moves into the first person. The way the text ends is, after the resurrection, it says, I, Simon Peter, and my brother Andrew uh, went, collected our nets and went fishing. And with us went Levi, son of Alphaeus, whom the Lord stops. That's it. That's where it ends. So it stops in the middle of a sentence, so you don't know what's going to happen next. So that's it. But it is interesting, this author claims to be Simon Peter. That's unlike Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are anonymous books. Matthew never claims to be written by somebody named Matthew. Matthew's written anonymously, and later editors said, oh yeah, that's the one Matthew wrote. And so they put the title, the Gospel According to Matthew, on it. The same with Mark, Luke, and John. They're all anonymous. This book claims to be written by Peter, but Peter certainly did not write the book. The book was written 60 or 70 years after Peter was dead, probably in the early 2nd century. This is an author claiming to be someone that he's not. In modern parlance, we call that a forgery. In the ancient world, they called it other things which were equally nasty. Uh, the two most common words for that kind of literary activity, where you would write a book claiming to be someone other than who you were, the two most common words in Greek, the language that these books are written in, uh, the first word is pseudos, which means a lie. These books were called lies. The other word uh, is uh, somewhat worse, it's nothos. These books were called, uh, were called notha. Nothos is a word that means bastard. So uh, they were bastard because the book doesn't legitimately belong to the person who's claimed as the author. So it's an illegitimate child. So these books are lies and bastards. Or a modern term, we would call them forgeries. Give you a second example. There's another, another one of these books that was discovered in 1886. Another one of the texts in this book, the 66-page book, is an apocalypse of Peter. Now, in the New Testament, we have the apocalypse of John. Uh, which almost didn't make it into the New Testament. There were debates about whether to include the Apocalypse of John or not. And involved in those debates about whether to include the Apocalypse of John were debates about another book that almost did make it into the New Testament, and it's this Apocalypse of Peter, which was also lost for centuries until it was discovered in 1886. The Apocalypse of Peter is very interesting because unlike the, gospel, the Apocalypse of John, which talks about the future history of the earth, the Apocalypse of Peter talks about the future of, the, of individuals. What happens to the soul after it dies? The Apocalypse of Peter involves a first-hand account of heaven and hell. When Peter, Simon Peter the disciple, is given a guided tour of heaven and hell by Jesus himself. Now, you all are familiar with the idea of being a, given a guided tour of heaven and hell from Dante's Divine Comedy. Well, Dante didn't make up the motif. He was basing it on a long tradition. The Apocalypse of Peter is the first instance we have of this motif in, in Christian literature. And it's very interesting indeed. Like many of the descriptions of heaven and hell that you get in ancient sources, the descriptions of heaven are a little bit banal and uninteresting. And the reason is because there's only so many ways you can describe eternal bliss. Oh, blessed are the saints in heaven. Yay, blessed are they. 
Happy are those saints. Yay, blessed and happy are the saints. Joyful are they. Yay, happy, blessed, joyful. I mean, what can you say? I mean, it's heaven. They're having a great time. On the other hand, if you want to describe the torments of the damned and you have any imagination at all, you can come up with a terrifically interesting account. And that's what happens here. It turns out in the apocalypse of Peter, when Peter goes to the realms of the damned, many individuals are punished according to whatever their characteristic sin was while living. And so, for example, people who blasphemed against God are hanged by their tongues over eternal flames because they use their tongues to lie against God. Peter goes to another place where he sees women who had braided their hair to make themselves attractive to men to seduce them. These women are hanged by their hair over eternal flames. In another place, the men they seduced are hanged by a different body part over eternal flames. And in this case, the men cry out, we didn't know it would come to this, <laughs> which I'm sure is true. Uh, so Peter goes through, uh, through this, uh, this sequence of heaven and hell, and, uh, and this whole thing is written in the first person as if Peter himself had, had experienced this. But nobody thinks this was written by Peter. This, in fact, is another second century book claiming to be written by Peter, even though it wasn't written by Peter. And so we have a gospel of Peter that was forged, an apocalypse of Peter is forged, and these two are only two examples of books from the early church that we have that claim to be by Peter. We have other epistles that claim to be written by Peter that Peter did not write. We have two other apocalypses of Peter that Peter did not write. Writing books in the name of Peter was a bit of a cottage industry in early Christianity. And it wasn't just Peter. We have forgeries in the name of a lot of the apostles from early Christianity. This practice of forgery in early Christianity does not make, it stand, make Christianity stand out as unique in the ancient world. Quite the contrary, forgery was a common practice throughout antiquity. We know this because we have a number of forgeries that survive that today we know are forgeries, and we know it because ancient people talk about the practice. It is interesting, and contrary to what you sometimes hear from biblical scholars, it is interesting that when ancient people talk about the practice of forgery, they condemn it. They speak of it as deceitful. They talk of it, about it as a, as a form of lying. They don't accept it, uh, even though it's widely practiced. And you say, well, if it, you know, if it's widely practiced, why, I mean, if it's not acceptable, why is it widely practiced? Well, you know, think for a second. There are a lot of things that are not acceptable that are widely practiced. I mean, cheating on income tax and adultery and you pick your, pick your thing. Well, in the ancient world, they condemned forgery. Well, what, what were the attitudes toward forgery in the ancient world? Let me give you a couple of anecdotes, ancient anecdotes, to explain what the views of forgery were in the ancient world. First, uh, a, a non-Christian example. There was a very famous author in the second Christian century, the second century, uh, a famous Roman author whose name was Galen. Galen was a physician and was an extremely prolific author. We have tons of books from him that still survive, many of them not translated into English. One of his books that is translated into English gives an autobiographical account of something that happened to Galen one day in Rome when he's walking through the streets of Rome. He was passing by a bookseller shop, and in the shop there were two men who were arguing over a book that allegedly was written by Galen. One person had just bought the book and was saying, I just bought this book by Galen. And the other, the other man took the book, read the first two lines, and said, this isn't by Galen. The style is all wrong. The writing style is all wrong. Well, this warmed the cockles of Galen's heart because it turned out he had not written the book. So he went home that afternoon, and he did write a book that is now uh, available. Uh, and sometimes this book that he wrote is called How to Recognize Books Written by Galen. <laughs> And so the idea was to, uh, you know, to show people which books he really wrote and which ones he didn't. Why? Because he didn't appreciate the fact that somebody had written a book claiming to be him when it wasn't him. Just as I wouldn't appreciate it if somebody wrote a book claiming to be me and, and staking out some position that I don't hold, uh, they didn't like it in the ancient world either. Forgery was widely condemned in antiquity. Give you a second example, a Christian example that talks about forgery. 
This is a book from the fourth Christian century, written, uh, scholars can date it pretty accurately, actually, to the year, around the year 380. So, about, you know, about 300 years after the apostles were dead. But it's a book that claims to be written by the apostles. This book is called The Apostolic Constitutions. It's an eight-volume work that talks about how to run the church, how to organize the church, how to structure the church, what different church officers are supposed to do, and so forth and so on. The book claims to be written by the 12 apostles of Jesus after Jesus' death. And one of the most interesting passages comes near the end, where the author, claiming to be the apostles, tells his readers not to read books that claim to be written by apostles but aren't. Wait a second. That's what you're doing. Why would an author tell you not to read the kind of book that he's producing? Precisely because he is throwing you off the scent of his own deceit. By saying that, you don't, you don't suspect him of doing what he's condemning. How widely was forgery condemned in the ancient world? It was condemned even in books that are forged. Forgery was not looked upon as an acceptable practice in antiquity, and yet people practiced forgery. Christians practiced forgery from outside the New Testament, such as the Gospel of Peter, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apostolic Constitutions, but are there any forgeries inside the New Testament? My contention in, in this book uh, that I've just written, Forged, is that in fact there are books of this sort in the New Testament, books that claim to be written by apostles that were not written by those apostles. Give you just a couple of examples. I've already indicated that writing books in the name of Peter was a wide practice. It was widely practiced even in earlier times. In the New Testament, there are two books that claim to be written by Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Scholars are virtually unified, uh, with the exception of fundamentalists and very conservative evangelicals. Everybody else agrees that whoever wrote 2 Peter, it was not the author of 1 Peter. They have completely different writing styles, which if you read them in Greek, they are as different as if you, uh, if you read Mark Twain and T.S. Eliot. They are very different writing styles. Moreover, almost everybody agrees that 2 Peter was not written by Peter. What about 1 Peter? I don't think Peter wrote 1 Peter or 2 Peter, and the reason I don't think he wrote 1 Peter or 2 Peter is because I don't think Peter could write. <laughs> what do we know about Peter? Well, in the New Testament, he's a fisherman in, in rural Galilee. Were fishermen in rural Galilee educated? The answer is almost certainly no. There have been studies of literacy in the ancient world that indicate that at the best of times in the ancient world, maybe 10% of the population could read. Far fewer than that 10% could write, and by write, I mean actually copy out letters. Fewer than that could compose, and fewer than that could compose something that was very elegant. First Peter is written in highly elegant Greek. The apostle Peter was a, an illiterate fisherman. By the way, he's called illiterate in the New Testament. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says that Peter was illiterate, unlettered. Agrammatos is the Greek, unlettered, unable, to, unable to read the letters. Uh, his language is Aramaic, the language of Palestine. First Peter is written in a highly literate Greek. Estimates of literacy in Palestine at this time uh, indicate that probably 3% of the population could read in Palestine, far fewer than in the population at large because it's largely a rural area, and reading and writing is taught mainly in urban areas among the arist aristocratic elite who can afford the time and the leisure for an education. Peter was not in that group. Now, it is theoretically possible that after the resurrection, Peter decided to go back to school. And he took some evening classes, and uh, as his foreign language requirement, he took Greek. Uh, and then, uh, then he got pretty good at it, and he decided he would take some composition classes, and he got pretty good at Greek composition, and so that at the end of his life, he wrote First Peter. I mean, theoretically, it's possible, but it seems unlikely. Now, a number of you are saying, maybe, maybe he dictated it and a scribe wrote it down. Maybe a secretary produced it for him. I'm getting some nods. Yes, a lot of you are thinking that because a lot of people say that. One of the things I try to show in my book is that it didn't work that way in the ancient world. 
This idea that you could have secretaries write books for you, there is no basis for it in the evidence that survives from antiquity at all, even though it's another thing scholars say all the time. Peter probably didn't write first and second Peter because he couldn't write. There are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul in the New Testament. Scholars talk about the seven undisputed Pauline epistles because six of these letters were probably not written by Paul. Now, in this case, we have a way of evaluating whether Paul wrote a specific letter. If you've got seven letters that you're pretty sure somebody wrote, and you've got another letter you're not sure about, you can compare it to the seven, which is what scholars do. They take the letters of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and Colossians and Ephesians and 2 Thessalonians, and they compare them with the seven undisputed letters. And in every case, there are wide-ranging differences in writing style, in theology, in presupposed historical situation in a number of ways that make it pretty clear whoever wrote the book of 1 Timothy, it wasn't Paul. And the same for the other six. If you add up the numbers, the way it works is this. There are a number of books in the New Testament that are anonymous. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are anonymous. Somebody later said they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, that, that's not the author's fault, so those are not forgeries. Uh, you can make the same claim for the book of Hebrews, which was accepted into the New Testament because people, church fathers, thought Paul wrote it, but it doesn't claim to be written by Paul. So it's, it's actually anonymous. First, second, and third John, the name John doesn't occur in them. The author doesn't tell you what his identity is. Those are eight books that are anonymous in the New Testament. You have the seven letters of Paul that are writ really written by Paul, and the book of Revelation is written by some guy named John. He doesn't say which John he is, he just says his name is John, and there's no reason to disbelieve him. He doesn't say he's John the disciple, he's just some guy named John. So that's probably uh, an authentic book as well. So that you've got eight books, at least, that are certainly written in the names of the people who claimed as their authors, eight others that are anonymous that are probably falsely assigned to people, and you're left with 11, letters, 11, 11 books that are, that are what I'm calling forged. Six of Paul's letters, I include the book of Acts, First and Second Peter, James, and Jude are not written by the people who are claimed as their authors. Eleven books in the New Testament that are probably forged. One of the ironies of this, of course, is that the New Testament is not only the basis of Christian faith today, but has been for centuries, and most of the books of the New Testament celebrate the importance of truth. They celebrate the importance of telling the truth, to one another. They celebrate the importance of Christ as the truth, as the true word of God who came into the world. How can a book that supports truth be based on a lie? How is it that an author who tells people to be truthful with one another, as the author of Ephesians does, how can he say that you are to take up the shield of truth? How is it that truth is important to an author when he's lying about his own identity? Well, this is a very interesting irony that, uh, that requires, I think, some reflection. In the ancient world, there were people, as there are today, who think that in some circumstances, it is better to lie than to tell the truth. In the ancient world, people talked about insta instances such as, if a doctor has to lie to a patient in order to get her to take her medicine, it's, it's a good thing for him to lie in order to accomplish that end. Sometimes the ends justify the means. It appears that Christian authors, some of whose works made it into the New Testament, had this point of view. They thought that it was more important that their ideas got across and so they would lie about their identity because they were nobody. If your name is Jehoshaphat and you write a letter to the Ephesians, you're not going to sign it Jehoshaphat. Nobody's heard of you. You write the letter to the Ephesians and you claim to be Paul. But it's a lie. Yes, it's a lie. And it's a book that insists on telling the truth. Yes, it's a book that insists on telling the truth. But there were early Christian writers who thought that sometimes they were justified in lying in order to tell the truth. Good question again, um, and I think uh, you've done a lot of research on this. What do you consider the most convincing evidence for the historicity of Jesus? Right. Did Jesus exist? I get two or three emails a week from people who want to know whether I think Jesus really existed or not. 
which puzzles me. I can see some of you are puzzled because I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yes, Jesus did exist. So what they want to know my uh, a compelling argument. Let me give you one argument. It's a little bit complicated. You know, you could say, well, you know, he's talked about in Josephus or he's talked about in a few Roman historians later. That, But you can discount all that if you want to. I, I think there's a, I'll give you one, one argument that strikes me as important. The earliest traditions about Jesus call him the Messiah and say that he got crucified. Those two things are incommensurate. Now, they don't seem incommensurate to people today because people think the Messiah had to get crucified because Jesus is the Messiah and he got crucified. But the idea of a Messiah is a Jewish idea, that there's going to be some future person sent from God as a savior for the Jewish people. What did Jews think this Messiah was going to be like? If they talked about Messiah, how did they talk? Well, there were actually different ways of understanding the Messiah in the ancient world. Some people thought the Messiah would be a great political figure, a warrior who would overthrow the enemy and set up God's kingdom in Jerusalem, a powerful figure who would overthrow the enemy. Other people thought that the Messiah was going to be a supernatural figure who was going to come from heaven to destroy the enemy and set up God's kingdom. And there were, there were a few other expectations. The one thing all these expectations had in common was that the Messiah was going to be a powerful figure who overthrew the enemy. And how did the Christians portray Jesus? Not as somebody who overthrew the enemy, but somebody who got squashed by the enemy, who was tortured to death by the Romans. Now, if you want to make up a story about the Messiah, would you make up the story that he got squashed by the enemy and got crucified, the lowest form of, of, of execution in the empire? No, I mean, if you're going to make up a story about the Messiah, you'd make up, well, actually, he, he overthrew the Romans, and he's the king in Jerusalem now. Well, why didn't they make up that story? Because he wasn't the king in Jerusalem, and everybody knew he wasn't the king in Jerusalem. Everybody knew that Jesus got crucified. This is why Christians had the hardest time convincing people that Jesus really was the Messiah. Because nobody expected the Messiah to be crucified. And you say, well, yeah, but doesn't the Old Testament say uh, he was bruised for our iniquities, wounded for our transgressions, is the chastisement for our peace is upon him, by his wounds we were healed, Isaiah 53? Yes, and look at Isaiah 53, read it sometime, and ask yourself, does it mention the Messiah? In fact, it doesn't mention the Messiah. It's not referring to the Messiah. Well, what about Psalm 22? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes, it isn't talking about the Messiah. Jews knew this, and Jews read these texts and said, look, these aren't even talking about the Messiah. Christians said, yes, they are. Jews said, no, they're not, and this was the argument. The point is, the idea of Jesus being a, a Messiah is a completely Jewish conception, but the idea that Jesus is crucified cuts completely against the Jewish conception of the Messiah, which means if somebody made up the story of Jesus, they would not have made up the story of a crucified Messiah. The reason you get the idea of a Christian crucified Messiah is because Christians said Jesus is the Messiah, and Christians knew that Jesus got crucified, and Christians concluded the Messiah must be crucified. That's the logic. But you wouldn't make it up. If somebody wouldn't make up that story, well, where does it come? It comes from there being a person, Jesus, who got crucified. So I think that's, that is one argument. QED, argue. yes. So, um, there's a series of questions uh, about... Uh, what it must be like uh, in your field as a non-believer quite comfortable with my with my beliefs how do intellects like yourself remain comfortable with the overwhelming influence of religious writings do they have any meaning for you do religious writings have any meaning for me as a non-believer um, yeah they do I mean I, I find the New Testament to be a very powerful book uh, but I read it the way I would read Shakespeare, as, as having important meaning, uh, even though I don't agree with a lot of the assumptions. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm an agnostic, so I, mean, I don't, believe, yeah. don't believe in God, but I still find the literature to be extremely valuable. What, what uh, puzzles me, given, I mean, it's a bit like, uh, although I don't want to get into a red herring about Darwin, <laughs> but... Um, in terms of the uh, biblical scholarship for the last 150 years, the, how do you explain the tremendous resistance 
on the part of many Christians to uh, what seems to me to be overwhelming evidence, which for me as a Christian, nothing that you've, you, you say has sort of um, causes me to doubt, although I have doubts about other things, and I could explain those sometime, but I mean, how do you, how do you explain or understand that tremendous resilience or resistance against so much evidence? Your scientific evidence, you mean, yeah. for, for evolution yeah. and such? Yeah, I was, I was uh, in Ch Chapel Hill where I teach is, uh, th the students are really terrific. I mean, they're very smart. But about seven or eight years ago, I was sitting around a table with maybe 10 students talking about evolution. And it turned out most of the students, none of the students, none of the students believed in evolution. And they said, it's just a theory. You know, like gravity is just a theory. Uh, and, and they couldn't believe that I, as an intelligent person, believed in evolution. They, and the way they put it is they, they couldn't believe that I thought we descended from lower forms of primate. I told them, look, the problem isn't that I think we descended from lower forms of primate. The problem is I think we descended from rocks. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so uh, why, why are people so resistant? I think people don't read very widely, and they don't take the right courses, and they don't use their brains. Uh, these are students who are otherwise intelligent. They just haven't taken science courses, so they don't know. Mm. Um, there's a question. Uh, uh, how do you respond to Lee Strobel's book, A Case for Christ? He's an investigative reporter, atheist turned Christian, who spent four years of intensive research into the archives of New Testament history. He interviewed 12 Bible scholars, including archaeologists and historians, including the archives of neighboring non-Christians who witnessed the events and confirm his findings. Maybe that you can't get into a conversation with uh, faith-based, um, I was going to say initiatives, faith-based uh, statements. Well, I think. But I, I think wondered how, you know, in, in, in Chapel Hill, in, in that atmosphere, how do you have uh, cordial, reasonable conversations? I think, um, I think you can have a conversation with somebody like Lee Strobel. He's not a scholar, and people shouldn't think that his book is a scholarly book. And he didn't do research, he interviewed people. Uh, he interviewed people who agreed with his point of view principally so that he could ma make a case based on his point of view. And that's. That's fine, but you need to recognize it for what it is. If somebody thinks that the Bible uh, is the inerrant revelation of God, as uh, people like Lee Strobel tend to think, then I think one can ask, is it, the inerrant is it inerrant or not? Are there errors or not? If there are errors, then it's not an inerrant book. And so I think you can actually have the conversation. And I think this in part because I used to agree with people like Lee Strobel. Was there, a, was, was there a revelatory moment or a breakdown, breakthrough for you when you suddenly said, this isn't working? Uh, yeah, but it was completely ridiculous. So uh, the, the way it worked was, uh, I, was at, I was at Princeton Theological Seminary, and I, I had been a hardcore evangelical Christian who thought the Bible had no errors in it of any kind. Uh, I, I had gone to Moody Bible Institute, which is a bastion of fundamentalism, and uh, thrived there. <laughs> and uh, so that now I'm at Princeton Theological Seminary. I, I have a paper I'm supposed to write on the Gospel of Mark, and I decide on a passage that's a famous problem where Jesus tells the, uh, his enemies that they should read the part of the Old Testament where uh, when, king, I mean, when, when Abi Athar was the high priest, King David went into the temple and ate the showbread. Mark chapter 2. Well, when you actually look up the passage in 2 Samuel, it's not Abiathar who was, the fa who was the priest at the time. It was his father, Ahimelech, who was the father, priest at the time. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's an error. It's a discrepancy. So I wrote a 35-page term paper arguing that, in fact, it's not a discrepancy. That even though Mark says that Abiathar was the high priest, he didn't really mean that Abiathar was the high priest. He meant that Ahimelech was the high priest. <laughs> and so I get the paper back from my professor, and the professor uh, liked the paper. Gave me, I mean, it was 35 pages of a grammatical argument, you know, I'm trying to make the case. And he, you know, he gave me an A on the paper, but at the bottom he said, maybe Mark just made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, maybe Mark just made a mistake. <laughs> and once I admitted that, uh, there was a chink in the armor, and things started unraveling at that point. It makes a metaphor. Uh, yeah, pardon the metaphor. It, yeah. I, it, it was hard for me, um, being, a, being on the a seminary faculty um, and teaching uh, 
spirituality, the life of prayer, meditation, and so on, that I came um, to, I, hate would be too strong a word, I came to dislike the Bible because of, on the one hand, the fundamentalists, and because of my scholar colleagues who were stuck in this historical critical method. And my own approach was literary and liturgical. And I kept saying to myself, trying to teach, a plague on both their houses. Uh, and I think of, uh, say, Brian Stocks listening for the text. He, he said history, and this is what puzzled me when you thought you said history was the same then as it is now, or the view of history. He says that history used to be a branch of rhetoric. If we wish to understand what is said in old or new social narratives, literary analysis is still necessary. For there are no tales without implied narrators and audiences. And I wondered if you were ever tempted or drawn to move into uh, literary criticism. Uh, no, I actually do do literary criticism when I want to play that game. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do historical criticism when I want to play that, that game. game. And I think that there are different rules for the different games, and the important thing is mm -hmm. to know which game you're playing. I think that's right. You know, yeah. because there are, um, there are some games where the line is in and other games where the line is out. Uh, and so if, you, uh, if you're playing tennis, the line is in. If you're playing basketball, the line's out. So uh, you need to know which game you're playing. That's, that's fair, I agree. In knowing what game we're in is all, all very, very crucial. I think why many people are talking at cross purposes when they're in different games. Um, someone's asked, how about a new book? Uh, how about working on the Quran? Yes, when I stop valuing my life, that's what I'll do. <laughs> all right. So there's a, a prudential... <laughs> um, a basic, uh, often question that's, uh, that's sort of under, underneath some of this. What do we know about the authorship of the book of Revelation? Is there any evidence it was the result of ancient shamanic practices involving hallucinogenic plants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it certainly sounds like it uh, in places. But uh, no, in fact, I think the way to understand Revelation is to understand it in light of other uh, works of the same genre. The thing about Revelation today is it just seems so weird because it's unlike anything we read. But it's not weird when you read other books of the same genre from written the same time. The idea of an apocalypse in which a vision is given to a seer and he sees all these bizarre visions and they get interpreted by an angel, uh, this is very common literature in the ancient world. So the, the reason people uh, have so many interpretations of Revelation today is because they are not familiar with how the genre worked. Uh, mm. You'd be trying to interpret a limerick poem without ever having seen a limerick poem before. You wouldn't understand it. It wouldn't make sense. And you can't understand an apocalypse unless you understand how apocalypses work. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I think uh, it's, again, knowing what game, yeah. uh, game you're, you're uh, playing. Um, I was going to ask you about the, uh, your point about pagan religions not emphasizing belief but practices. And... Uh, I think that's part of an interesting conversation g going on now where many people, for example, um, are talking about the Eucharist mm -hmm. as a spiritual practice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and moving away from, you know, 50 impossible things to believe before breakfast kind of religion to actual practices that lead to certain um, ways of treating people and being in the world. And do you see, do you see some movement in that direction? Uh, well, I see movements in both directions. I think that in I think a lot of uh, a lot of the world is moving toward a more conservative Christianity that still relies on uh, statements of faith. But I, I think uh, in this country and in other places too that there are movements more toward liturgical forms of of Christianity, mm -hmm. where truth claims are not really the point. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, my, my, my wife is an Episcopalian, and she's a Christian, and nothing that I write has any effect on her faith at all. I mean, I can say the most... I like her already. Yes, yes. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> uh, and she just, she doesn't care whether the Bible has forgeries or not. This isn't my, And so she's not my audience, uh, mm. she, uh, as she tells me. <laughs> I think, I think uh, what... what what 
I hope for is to be able to enlarge and broaden the conversation so that people who are talking at cross purposes and are not in the same game, and when I use the word game, I'm taking that very, very seriously. I was thinking when I was reading Forge, uh, I was also reading Jaron Lanier's book, um, You Are Not a Gadget. I don't know whether people know that. And he says, um, he says uh, information systems need to have information in order to run. But he says this interesting thing, information underrepresents reality. In other words, just getting stuff and getting all the data lined up um, doesn't actually yeah. get us very far. Um, and how do you then initiate a conversation when we're much more respectful and exploratory w with these ideas and these stories and these narratives? Yes. No, I think, you know, the, the, one of the audiences I do try to address are, are fundamentalists and trying to put a chink in the armor, the way I had a chink put in my armor. But it's precisely not to move them so that they'll necessarily become an agnostic like me. But I do think that there are other ways of being religious that are more uh, that are probably better for them and better for the world, uh, where the uh, point is not having absolute certitude about a set of doctrinal facts. Mm. Because once you have certitude about doctrinal facts, you can increase the list until all of a sudden your doctrinal facts include all sorts of things that are damaging mm. to, to people in the world. And so I, I think that kind of religion is not very helpful. No, I don't know why we're so rooted in uh, historicity of things where people... My, my, I used to drive my kids crazy because we'd be watching a movie and they would say, is this a true story? And I would always say, yes. And then they'd look again, they'd say, no, 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 did this really happen? Mm. And I'd say, no. Right. I remember Marcus Borg uh, preaching on the um, miracle at Cana, saying he began his sermon with, this did not happen. Now let me tell you why it's true. And it was a kind of revelation, an opening, opening uh, for, for people. And it's that um, kind of literalism uh, that I think is crippling uh, crippling us in so, so many ways, how we talk to each other about these uh, important subjects. Um, I wanted to um, therefore ask you <laughs> about the importance of fiction again, and then we can, we can adjudicate between good fiction and bad fiction, can't we? We can have literary criticism and, and understand what's the story. For me, for example, the, what keeps me a Christian is that for me it's a fascinating ever expanding explosion in anthropology of what the human project is about how we're going to be with each other as human beings uh, and far from you know answering questions it keeps deepening the questions and i know i'm a minority tradition in that but it's that kind of um, ever fresh sense of well what on earth is this uh, human project about and why you know i can respond to your your work, but um, want to, I suppose, meet your wife. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, in other words, we're not reducing, it, it's, it, what you're doing, I don't think, um, is total reductionism, but what would you say to a young student, um, open, who, who's a practicing Christian, um, who, is just beginning to be open to New Testament studies. What do you say to, you don't, I mean, I don't, you don't seem the sort of person who willfully and gleefully destroys people's no. confidence no, no, no. or faith, so. Well, I think people, I think people, so okay, so I teach students who are 19 and 20 year olds who have been raised in very uh, conservative evangelical circles where the Bible is never, uh, talked about except as being the uh, infallible revelation from God. Uh, this is a view that I find to be unhelpful. Uh, they, uh, these, uh, they are also taught that since the Bible condemns homosexuality, that uh, gay relationships are wrong. They're taught that since the Bible... Slavery is okay, though, is it? Slavery is okay, sure, that's Because that's, that's in approved. the Bible. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, women are not allowed uh, to uh, exercise a role of authority in the church because that's what the Bible says, and you just go down the list. Uh, I think that uh, 
the the best way to get people to be more reflective about the religion is to is to talk talk to them where it's at the weakest point and i think the weakest point for that kind of fundamentalism has to do with the bible itself and and what you what you're objecting to i mean i know you're not really objecting but the historical critical method can be used in order to disabuse people of their assumption yeah. their fundamentalist assumptions and so i use it as a strategy as a way of trying to get to people so that they have to realize they can't maintain this way of looking at the world anymore, a way that is extremely dangerous, not just for women and for gays, but for all sorts of things involving, I mean, just everything from, from, uh, from certain forms of nationalism on down, uh, mm -hmm. I think it ends up being an extremely dangerous way of looking at the world. I think you're right. I think uh, St. John of the Cross, one of my heroes, said, in the end we shall be examined in love. That's it. And my test of anyone's orthodoxy, whatever orthodoxy they claim, is if you were in charge, would I be safe? That's what I want to know. And if the answer is yes, we can fight and argue about anything you like. We have to stop. <laughs>